Well, tonight we are beginning uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, the letter to the church in Thyatira. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to go to the website. I didn't put a long, boring video on it this week. Um, I did put one from the Bible Project. I love those. And some of these, I'm, I'm going to continuously put videos on there, e even if they seem like they're, they're disassociated from what we're studying, because there's a lot of things that we need to catch up as we go. They're going to make sense later. And so instead of before we get to a certain chapter, you know, dumping 14 videos on you, you want to do, I want to kind of get this up there so you can start to imagine and see things the, the way the scripture intends for you to see them so that you can um, understand terms in in ways that maybe the first century Jew understood them because that is the audience to which John is writing. He's not writing to a 21st century church that uses terms like sus and, and whatever else, right? He's writing to these people. So we need to understand those and understanding things like the image of God and the way God looks at the physical and the spiritual is very important, especially today. We live in a, in a world, in our Western church, we practice a lot of, um, a lot of what really is, is Platonism. Um, Platonism is, is the is the belief in, in, in Plato's kind of philosophy. And, and what Platonism kind of says is the physical and the spiritual are two separate things that were never meant to be together. That, that we're in the physical and the physical is bad. The world is bad, things are bad. Everything that is physical is, is really bad and corrupted. And so what our goal is, is to become spiritual, to become the ethos, to separate from that entirely. And that notion is not biblical, but that notion is very powerfully ingrained in the way many people as Christians today view their understanding of it. That's why we very quickly um, embrace the idea of, well, when I die, I'm going to spend eternity in a spiritual place far away from here, and God's going to get rid of the physical. And you don't see that language in the scripture. The scripture goes out of its way to make clear that God created the physical and the spiritual and meant for them to be together, but because of sin, they are separated. And God's goal, his restorative work, when Jesus returns, is that he will come and he will bring heaven here. He will make this an eternal place where we will be in his presence. We will be resurrected. We believe in the resurrection, a fleshly resurrection, and we will be in bodies that are imperishable, according to the Apostle Paul. So I'm, I'm going to have my six-pack, and I'm going to eat Krispy Kremes all day long, okay? So that's, I don't know if that's true, but I'm going for it. That, that's where I'm basing some of my hope. I know that's cheap, but hey. Um, so, so we need to understand that this is really a part of who we are, and that's why I wanted us to watch that video today. The, the image of God is something that God placed in us as created beings that separates us from the rest of creation. And we're going to see how we use that a lot in the book of Revelation and how that is being addressed. Okay, then let's go to Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And this, uh, just so you guys know, I've been reading out of the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. I, I personally am a fan of it. It's fairly easy to read and, and it's a pretty good translation. But anyway, verse 18. And to the angel in the church of Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress, unless they repent of her doings, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts, and I will give each of you as your works deserve but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, I will give authority over the nations. 
to rule them with an iron rod, as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my father, to the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. So let, let's go back and review the, the first three churches real quick. And if you have your, your worksheet, these are the first parts on there also. To the church in Ephesus, quickly, he, um, he talked to them about their spirit of boundary keeping, right? We're perfect. We keep them out. We got a big old, the church is the place for the holy people. We got to keep the heathens out. Don't want them contaminating this, this perfectly good and um, um, sanitary, I, I don't know the word I'm looking for here, place. So what they did was they practiced orthodoxy without love. They had no love. Uh, to the church in Smyrna, they, they had a, a spirit of, of consumerism. They had this, this temptation they faced to play ball for the sake of success that in their in their context they needed to to play ball with the people if they wanted to succeed and in pergamum he talked about the spirit of accommodation which is to say that they allowed the world to dictate the word of god to them and to say well that's okay if we practice these certain things because the word of god actually allows it if we decide to look at it in a certain aspect so then we get to this um to the church in thyatira now let, let me read a little bit about thyatira to you a little Real quick uh, history thing here. Little is known of the church at Thyatira. It's mentioned only indirectly elsewhere in the New Testament in Acts 16, 14. And according to some ancient authorities, a Christian church was established there only at the end of the first century. The city was located about 35 miles inland between Pergamum and Sardis. It was known for its trade guilds, including clothiers, uh, bakers, tanners, potters, linen workers, wool merchants, slave traders, shoemakers, coppersmiths, and dyers. It was uh, also a center of the indigo trade. Uh, Lydia, Paul's first Christian convert in Europe, which is what you find in Acts 16, verses 14 through 15 and verse 40, was from Thyatira. She probably learned her trade of selling purple cloth in her hometown. The god Thyremnos also known as Apollo, the son of Zeus, was the patron of the bronze guilds and guardian of the city. Now, th this is going to be important here. So this city is known for guilds. Do you guys know what a guild is? G-U-I-L-D. What is a guild? It's like a union. A union, yeah, right? I, I hear the word guild. And, and, and for me, the, the first time I heard that was on The Wizard of Oz, when the weird little munchkins start singing in the name of the Lollipop Guild, the Lollipop Guild. Remember them? <laughs> yeah. They were creepy. So guilds are creepy to me. I uh, just wanted to share that with you, even though that was useless information. I didn't know what that was until actually I started studying theology and learned about the guilds of the first century. So yeah, guilds are basically, they're a lot like unions uh, but more than that they're uh they, they might be like a mix between a union and the the chamber of commerce if you will they are the place where people from different businesses would come together and uh decide how they were going to do their work who are we going to hire where are we going to set our prices at how are we going to approach this market and they would they would work together in the guilds and even in the guilds you would get permission to to sell in that particular community. So it's very overseen, lots of bureaucracy about how to do business. So if I'm in a community and I have a, a trade, say I'm a, a, a coppersmith, I, I moved to Thyatira and I'm a coppersmith, what might be one of the first things I want to do when I move to Thyatira? Probably want to go guild. find a guild. Copper. Yeah, I want to go join a copper guild, right? I want to go join them, get hooked up with them, say, hey, I'm, I'm from Sardis. I'm known for my product. Uh, can I join your guild and be a part of what's happening here so that I can sell my products? It's a real big thing. Now, they had a lot of different guilds there, but one of their biggest ones was bronze. And as a, their, their bronze guild and the bronze manufacturing was very important to this community. And Apollo was the patron god of the bronze guilds. So they were very big on Apollo there as well. So, here we are in a community of Thyatira, and if Apollo is our patron saint, how do you think the community feels about Apollo? 
Think they feel positive towards him or negative towards him? They probably positive. feel positive. Yeah. Yeah, they probably feel pretty positive about it, right? They're like, okay, Apollo is our patron god. Everybody, everybody better be nice to Apollo. Because if we're not nice to Apollo, if we don't please Apollo, then it's going to cost us. And at the end of the day, we're all in this for the profit, right? Nobody, nobody joins a, a job or starts a business for practice. We're in it for the profit. Okay, so Apollo is very important to them. But if you know anything about Greek mythology, who is Apollo? Who, who's his dad? Zeus, isn't it? Zeus is his dad. Now, Zeus is like the head Greek god, right? He, he's kind of number one, if you will. Zeus, Zeus has a couple of brothers, um, Poseidon and, and Hades. But really, at the end of the day, Zeus is boss. And he likes to let them know, I, I'm, the, I'm the brother who's in charge of all things here. And Apollo's my son. Means that Apollo would also be called the son of God. So when you're in a community that has Apollo, the son of God, as your patron saint, and you also are very patriotic to Rome and serve the emperor, who is also called what? Son of God. Son of God. Son of God. Yeah, absolutely. Because his father, who died before him, was deified in death, making the title of Augustus, the title of um, um, Domitian, I can't even think, Dom Domitian, uh, the, the Nero, whoever it is. Their father was God, making them the son of God. So when you read this letter to the angel of the church at Thyatira, these are the words of the son of God. Do you see the jab they're taking directly to this community? This is an intentionally very carefully scripted words here that Jesus uses for them. Um, say to them, these are the words of the son of God. That's me. In other words, he's saying, I am the sole authority and deity. Not Caesar, not Apollo. So why don't you hear the words of the true son of God? So it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, nice jab that he takes at them there. But then he also says, the son of God, whose eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, the burnished bronze would kind of make sense, right? Because I'm in a guild that does a lot of bronze and, and copper work, right? Okay, so his, his feet are like burnished bronze. But where, where might we have seen a statement like that before? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yes. Who do, where, where, does, where have we heard this before? Describing Jesus' feet. He's describing Jesus' feet? Was that in Daniel? In Daniel. In Daniel, yep. It was in Daniel 10. Uh, Daniel has a really weird vision. And after fasting for 21 days, for three full weeks... On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the river, this is Daniel 10, verse 4, I looked up and I saw a man clothed in linen with a belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like gleam of burnished bronze. So this image that he's talking about here, that Jesus is even saying, he's, he's pointing back to Daniel. I'm the same God. I'm the same God that appeared in Daniel's vision. I am the ultimate God, the son of God, and there is no other God beside me. So here we see another, another very important and direct um, parallel to, to Daniel and to the Old Testament. And we're going to see a lot of that in here. John intentionally does this. And he does this because he expects the reader or the hearer to get this, to know this, to understand these things. Uh, as I was thinking about this earlier, it made me think of, so imagine I wrote a letter and I wanted to write a letter to the church in Detroit. And I said something along the lines of, to the church in Detroit, write this, um, to the, from the one who, the only one who truly gets you where you need to go, and to the one who, the only one who really wears the bow tie. What, what, what references might we see there? What references do you, do, you, do you hear? What's Detroit famous for? I'm thinking cars. For cars, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so if we're talking about the, you know, a bow tie, what, what reference might that be to in Detroit? Oh, the Chevy symbol. Oh, yeah, Chevy. the Chevy symbol, the great bow tie, right? Got the bow tie up front, the Chevy bow tie. Chevy headquarters are in Detroit. And people in Detroit 
would grasp that. They're like, oh, oh, he, he's making a reference to our Chevy headquarters over here that used to, uh, where, where my grandfather used to work or my dad used to work or whoever worked at, right? So we're a part of what helped build this city. So when he makes these references, it's important that we today realize that this is similar to what he's doing. He's making references to a city that people there especially are going to understand and he expects the audience to get as well. But most people today, if we just read this and say, the words of him were the son of God, we think, well, of course, he's calling himself the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. But most Christians today don't realize that Caesar uh, commonly called himself the son of God, that he was known that way, or that Apollo would have been called the son of God. And Apollo was the patron saint, uh, the patron God of the city, where the burnished bronze was a jab at their guilds, which he's about to talk a lot about. And also a reference back to Daniel saying, you know, I am God. So these connections are important and they're made for the reader or the hearer to understand and to grasp. In verse 19, he says, I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. So the works that he claims to them or that he, um, that he commends them for are works of love. In other words, we've seen this already. If you love someone, it means you care enough to do something. Right, so why he told the 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 the, the first church uh, in uh, in Ephesus, you you you've forgotten your first love. You're not helping anyone. You're so busy protecting yourself. You don't have love. Love is an action. He tells them that they have faith. In other words, they trust enough to obey God. That they he knows their service, their beneficial acts towards others. He talks about their their perseverance, which is going to be a very important word throughout this book. But perseverance is quite simply the, the continuance despite pressures against them. They, they are receiving pressure to not act in a certain way or to not obey in a certain way. And they're continuing regardless of that. They are persevering. And then he says, and you're doing more, which is a really good thing. We, um, we should always be doing more than we did at first. Why? Why would it be important for us to be doing more than we did at first? Shows growth and improvement. Yeah, it shows growth and, and improvement. Yeah. If I show up and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to join the church thing. I'm going to be a Christian. And yeah, I might volunteer for a thing or two. That, that's great. Those become means of grace that help us to grow. But the more I mature in Christ, the more I'm sanctified by the Holy Spirit, the more I'm driven and compelled to change the pattern of my life, so it becomes a life pattern of doing these things, not doing these things just when I'm at church, which is a pretty common task today, right? To say, I'm a Christian, I do Christian things when I go to church or I'm at Christian functions. But outside of those, I kind of do different things. We walk into church, I, I imagine the church service as uh, that, that time when we gather with, with the groom. Uh, the church is the bride of Christ. And at church, we gather together you know, very intimately with the groom, with Christ. And many times the way I imagine Christians is we walk into church, we get dressed, we'll show up. Um, sometimes we'll even show up on time and, and we'll start to, to come into church for our, our one hour a week gathering to be with our groom that we, we profess to love so much. We want to spend an eternity with him. We come in all dressed up nice. We got our, our wedding ring on because we're the bride of Christ, right? We're ready to look that way and act that way. And we come into church. And we do the church thing. We pray. We might even throw the hands up in the air because I'm feeling the spirit today. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to do different hand things so I don't feel weird doing it. And, and I might come to the altar. And then we get done with church and, and we say hi to everybody, invite everybody. And we do a little fellowship and we start to walk out into the parking lot. And as we walk into the parking lot, I, I spiritually just see a whole lot of people walk out there and they do this. They grab their wedding ring and they take it off and they put it in their pocket so that they can go about the rest of their week without this cumbersome nonsense of being married to Christ, ruining or hindering the way they live life during the week. We're, we're to grow in Christ. It should be something that we're compelled to. Our, our, our Christian life isn't about coming to church. It's supposed to be something that consumes everything that we do. And this is why he addressed them. You're getting better. You are maturing. He says, but I have this against you. You tolerate that, that, that woman Jezebel. Well, who's Jezebel? Is there a person in their church named Jezebel? And, and she's in there just ruining things? Is that what he's saying? It was King Ahab's wife. 
Oh, he was King low. Ahab's wife. Okay, so you're catching. This is a reference. This isn't a literal thing, right? He's not saying you, you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel as if there's a person named Jezebel and they're tolerating. He's making a connection. He's saying you tolerate that woman Jezebel, this, this person, this entity, this spirit, whatever it is, that, that was a wife of Ahab. So what else do we know about Jezebel? Tell me a little bit about her. Wasn't she a prostitute? No. Go ahead. She claimed to be a prophetess. And she, I um, can't remember his name, but she threw a tantrum because she wanted somebody's grape vineyard. Nahum. Yeah, right. Yeah. Nahum, oh, yeah. Yes. Her husband wanted. Her husband like, threw a tantrum. Just kill him and take it. Yeah. Right. Exactly. If you go to 1 Kings 16. Uh, we start to see uh, a little bit about uh, Jezebel beginning in verse 29. It says, In the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Uh, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So what kind of a king was Ahab? This guy was a horrible king, right? He did evil. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebet. So as if it wasn't bad enough, basically, that, that he was a horrible, horrible person, he took his, his wife, Jezebel. He marries this lady, Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians. Now, do you guys know the name of one of the primary uh, gods against God that they're always worshiping? N name some of the gods. Baal. Oh. Baal, right? Now, if you notice Ethbal's name, he's got Baal in his name, right? Baal. So the name <laughs> Ethbaal, it means the son of Baal, right? So he, or with Baal. So he's with Baal. So this tells you a little bit about the king. So Jezebel's dad is with Baal, right? This is his namesake. And Jezebel, some even, some people kind of say that her name Jezbaal is Itzbaal, might, might, you know, be also a thing saying, you know, married to Baal, but uh, it, it's kind of a, a shortened version. But, but she's definitely a, a person who serves Baal, right? This is who she is. And this is the problem. Ahab wants to make a treaty, so he marries Jezebel. Because if I married the daughter of a king who might be my enemy, he becomes my ally. So he marries her. So he marries Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of the Sidonians. And he went and he served Baal and worshipped him. So I married her, and I went ahead and started worshiping her God, doing what she wanted me to do. He erected an altar of Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made a sacred pole. Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than all the kings who were before him. So this isn't a good guy to be compared to, and his wife is definitely not the kind of person that you, you want to be compared to either. Um, right? She's, she's a horrible person who is definitely not in God's favor. So he tells them, you tolerate that Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and beguiling my servant, my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So Jezebel for them uh, is really is, is, a, is a representation of the people's adultery against God. And so when we see Jezebel used in the scriptures, this is how she's used. She has become the, the personification of our adultery against God. So to act like a Jezebel doesn't necessarily mean to act like a harlot. I know that's kind of how we use it today. But in the biblical terms, to, to be a Jezebel or to follow Jezebel is to engage in acts of adultery against God. In other words, to sin against God, to practice idolatry. And throughout the Old Testament, everywhere you see the prophets talk about this, they, they're very clear to compare it this way, to say, your acts of idolatry, your acts of, of worshiping that thing are acts of adultery against God. Um, think about uh, the, the book of Hosea, right? That poor guy, I, I don't even know how to take the prophet Hosea. Some some days I read it and I feel super sorry for him. And some days I think that he's truly blessed because he's given a wife to Mary Gomer, who God tells him, she's going to be unfaithful on you. She's going to do nothing but cheat on you. But you're going to keep trying to bring her back and bring her into your house. That way you know how I feel. Because in the same way, that's what the people are doing to me. 
And when you read books like Ezekiel or Jeremiah or, or any of the other prophets, what you find is God always telling them, look, you guys are, you're acting. He, in fact, he tells Israel at some points, he says, you're acting like whores. You're going around seeking all of these other gods to be with you, but I'm your husband. He's comparing idolatry, the, 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 the worship of other gods. He's, he's comparing these things to adultery. And so this term Jezebel is, is for any person in the first century, especially in Jew, they can say, okay, he's accusing them of adultery, of worshiping other things alongside God, of engaging in adultery. So the guilds are, are a big thing. We're going to shift gears and kind of bring this together here. The, the guilds are a big thing in, in Thyatira, these guilds. And at these guilds, when they would gather, it's not like a chamber of commerce meeting that you might have today. If you go to a chamber of commerce meeting, you might walk in, maybe you say the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know, you go through some order, you do some things. But these guilds engaged in a lot of um, idolatrous acts to be a part of the guild. You, you would show up there and the guilds were, were known for being basically parties, for being very pagan-like parties and a lot of things happened at the guilds and kind of the mentality was look it's a guild what happens at the guild stays at the guild we do our thing here but this is how we we know that we're good for each other because if i can get all these people that i'm supposed to trust to to sin with me to do this thing with me then i know i can trust you but if you're not willing to engage in this act with me i'm not exactly sure that i can trust you or you can be a part of our guild so if you want to be a part of it you want to do business here you need to engage in these acts. And so what, what she was teaching, this prophetess, what she's teaching the people is to, to engage in a separation between the physical and the spiritual. They, they were basically saying, look, it's okay to do this because my relationship with God, Yahweh, is spiritual. And these are just fleshly things. And eventually I'm going to get rid of the flesh anyway, and it doesn't matter. I mean, I have to eat, I have to do these. And these are, these are battles, um, to be fair, they're the, the tensions that we engage in even today. I mean, think about it. How many of us have had some struggle of some sort saying, okay, um, this is what I need to do for my job, but this is where my faith lies. So how do I balance that? I, I know, for example, people who say, uh, pastor, I, I don't believe, you know, drinking is right, but, you know, I, I work for the winery. I, I don't know what to do. That, that's, you know, it's my job. Or, you know, pastor, um, I got this job, it's all I got, and, and I know I'm supposed to be at church on Sunday, but I got to work on Sunday, right? These are real dilemmas that, that we wrestle with. So what might be some other dilemmas that, that you've wrestled with or that we wrestle with that, you know, we have to recognize that maybe there is a gray. What areas of life do we see that in? Or is everything pretty black and white for everyone? Well, I know uh, working for a grocery store, they sold cigarettes and alcohol, even though I didn't believe in it. And I sold a thousand other different types of items. That was a part that would come through our, our registers. And we feel guilty about doing, knowing that we don't want them to do that. But there's not many places that you can work that doesn't sell something against your Christianity and your beliefs. So what do you do? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So we have to find our, our balance in there, right? And we have to be honest with ourselves, friends. We live in a tension. Our, our world is fallen. And shy of being monastic and going out in a desert, it's impossible to not be in the world, right? So we have to be very careful and tread carefully and with wisdom. What are, what are some other areas? About um, How about our taxes um, going towards Planned Parenthood? Or something like that. I mean, that's even, it's even out of our hands, right? I mean, can we really say, no, I don't want my taxes going to that, going to, towards abortion or, or whatever else? Yeah, that, that's legitimate. I mean, so we say, okay, I'm paying taxes and my taxes go towards abortion. They go towards all kinds of things that I, that I'm opposed to. Right. And so I, I have a choice. I can not pay my taxes and go to jail which isn't going to work very well, right? Or I can leave the country and refuse to participate with America, but you know, where am I gonna go? What am I going to do? So yeah, we, we definitely have to live in this tension. And, and I want us to be aware of that, to recognize that these things are real and, and because they're real, all the more reason we need to gather the way we're doing even now and as a church. 
so that we can uh, talk through these issues and, and work through these issues and find ways to, to imagine how do I live here and do this without offending God? How do I become Daniel in Babylon, right? And Daniel and his whole, okay, I don't want to eat the sacrificed meat, so I'm going to eat vegetables and I'm going to make sure I stay healthy doing it, right? How do I serve the king of Babylon without um, dismissing God or being unfaithful to God? And it's not easy. It's not black and white. It's not something we just say, well, I'm just going to do it. And that's all there is to it. But that's a very um, naive standpoint of reality, right? Okay. But there's also the point where because of that, because of that reality, and we all know that that reality exists, even if we don't, we don't openly say it. I think everyone's aware that that's a reality. But because of that, it's very easy for us to also say, okay, well, because of that, the way I'm going to reconcile it is I'm going to say that what happens outside of church isn't church. So you know what, if I, if I have to be dishonest for work, then I have to be dishonest for work. It's separate. It doesn't matter. You know, it's a totally different thing. The, the world is different from the church, is different from this. So I'll be a good Christian during when I need to be a good Christian. But I'm also going to be, you know, shrewd or whatever I need to be in the world when I'm in the world. And that's how I'm going to act. And sadly, that's not what we're supposed to do. We, we, we can find ourselves quickly crossing that line. And that is what happened in Thyatira. Um, the guild meetings started um, practicing this mentality of this is how we're going to act. And a lot of the people in the church of Thyatira were like, look, so if I go to a guild meeting and I engage in, in eating of the food of idol idols or, or engage in this fornication and this idol worship, whatever it is, you know, that's fine. That's business. It's nothing personal, God. It's business. So don't take it personal. I just, I have to do it. I don't want to, but I have to do it to make things happen. And, and we try to have that, that kind of conversation with God. And so this, this Jezebel spirit, this person Jezebel, you know, even if it's a real a person that they're talking about that was doing this, is teaching that there's a separation between the physical and the spiritual. This, this, this Plato, this Socrates teaching. And this is what we talked about earlier, that there is this modern belief, even today, that there's a split between the secular and the spiritual. And because of that, I can easily justify more of the things I do in the secular or how I handle the secular because you know what? The secular is all going to be trashed anyway. Because of our separation, our mindset of a separation between the, the secular or the physical and, and the spiritual, we find Christians backing out from a lot of things that Christians should take the lead on. Uh, the, the idea of peace through peace is, is what Christ taught. But, but Christians usually take the lead on, no, nah, we need to engage in a holy war. We're not Muslims. We're not pagans. We don't do that. And God doesn't do that. And later, as we, as we read into Revelation, we're going to find that Revelation makes clear that Jesus never rides the war horse. He will not ride it. Um, as Christians, we should be taking the lead in things like caring for our environment. I'm not saying that, that global warming is, is a man-made thing or, or, or you know, that, that it's not, there's not some political agenda behind it. But I got to tell you, when it comes to caring for creation, for God's creation, Christians should be leading that charge saying, my God made this planet and we should take care of his creation as best as we can because he put us in charge of caring for it. But we're so afraid of, no, no, I, I don't want to. That way I can excuse myself when I act in other ways. We have to be very careful because this mindset has contaminated the church just like it did in Thyatira. And then we do engage as Christians a lot in that this isn't spiritual, it's business. Jesus doesn't care. Think about even in our politicians. I, I had someone tell me that, um, that a person's uh, ethics should not be involved or their, their, their faith should not interfere with their politics. Well, how can your faith not interfere with your politics? Your faith, whatever it is, is that thing that defines, that creates your ethics and your morality. And that should drive your politic because your politic is how you respond and act in, in the polis, in the community. So our politics should definitely reflect our faith. And we should expect that all of our politicians to reflect Christ-like. Ask yourself, next time you look at a politician, does that look like Jesus? Would Jesus say that? Would he do that? And I've heard people say, well, you know what? Um, we, we don't need that kind of a person running this. We just need someone to get the job done. We need someone to do this. I need someone to do that. And, and, and that, at the end of the day, is really more important. That's perfectly fine if you don't believe in Jesus or the words that he said. 
And this is the warning that he's given to Thyatira. They teach this innocent, harmless participation. Somehow, you know, it's okay to do this. No, no one's getting hurt. It's not going to hurt God if I'm out there doing this. But try to imagine the same thing with your spouse, if you would. Imagine if I came home to Trina and I said, hey, you know, if I was a salesman or whatever, I said, hey, hey, babe, yeah, man, I got this big account. I wanted to, to land and, and I landed it. I did have to flirt with the lady a little bit. You know, we kiss some, but don't worry about it. But I got the account. I didn't think my wife's going to respond to that. We'd be at your funeral. Yeah, you ain't even kidding. Oh my goodness. I'd be dead if I'm lucky. Because it's not going to go over well, but we treat God the same way. You know what? Yeah, I know God. I know it's not right, but you know, I had to do this for this reason, or I had to do that. You understand. I had to make that deal. I had to do this thing. I had to engage in that thing that I know is a little bit shady, but you know, I had to do it. And God warns us, listen, flirting, flirt, flirting is how we get there. We need to not flirt. We need to practice wisdom and do everything we can to not participate in those kind of things. And it has also led us in this world where we have this belief that our that our spirit and our heart can be can be different than our actions. How many of us have heard said or even said, um, you know, you don't know somebody's heart, only God knows their heart. So you, you don't know what's really inside of them. I, I remember saying that. I've heard that many times. It's crazy though, because while the scripture says that God does judge the heart, Jesus makes it clear in more than one occasion that you do know somebody's heart very clearly by their acts. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. He doesn't say, you can get a pretty good idea by their fruit, but at the end of the day, only I know their hearts. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. Jesus says, by this, they will know you by your love. Not by this, they're, they're gonna, they, they might have a pretty good idea about you, but at the end of the day, don't let no one judge you because nobody knows your heart. Listen, people should know your heart. If they don't know your heart, you're not engaging in your faith, right? I love to raz, uh, Sister Lupe. I do. Um, and, and this is this is a lighter, uh, kind of a, a lighter end of this. But I would love to raz her because I know she's an Oakland fan. I know she loves the Raiders. You know how I know she loves the Raiders? Because her actions reflect what's on her heart when it comes to football teams. Now, I, I can raz her because I also know her heart at the end of the day that at the end of the day for her, it's a football game. That, that if, if the Raiders left the earth, it's not going to bother her that much because her focus is on Christ. I know that about Sister Lupe. That's why I can razz her and not fear too much for my life. Now, I wouldn't put a 49er sticker on her car because I might get smacked a little bit, but I know her heart, right? The same thing about our faith. We need to get out of this mentality that nobody knows our heart because the, this mentality has led us to a church that also lacks accountability. Since nobody knows my heart and I can't know nobody's heart, I don't need accountability. I don't need to go to church. I don't need people to, to tell me this. We are told by the scripture to continue to gather. And one of the reasons is you cannot, you cannot participate in a faithful walk with Christ unless you are a part of a local church body that you have given permission to hold you accountable to. You cannot serve under a pastor unless you make yourself an open member of that church saying, I'm going to give you permission right here in front of you, in front of God, in front of the congregation to hold me accountable and to make me accountable to the things that God says. And if you don't do that, you cannot possibly walk with God. And if you think you can, then you're, you're contradicting the scripture that says you can't. You're contradicting the very way God said to create things. That the spirit of our heart can be different than from these forced things that, that hold, you don't know what's in my heart, don't judge me, is a spirit of privatized faith. And that's what we have here in Thyatira. We have a spirit of privatized faith. And think about the vocabulary we use today. It's just a personal relationship between me and Jesus. Okay, what scripture do you get that out of? Because the Bible I read, over and over again, says that it is a personal relationship between you and Jesus that is held public with the church. The, the scriptures know nothing of a privatized faith. You will not find that anywhere in the Bible. It is a communal faith. And this privatized faith makes it easy for me to justify doing things that I want to do, because after all, you don't know what's in my heart. 
And Jesus tells him, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. And I love this because first of all, it speaks about Jesus's faith, right? His mercy. I'm giving her time to repent. I want her to repent. God doesn't want to lose a single person, but she's unwilling. And, and here's, here's the reason she's unwilling. And this is what we need to be very careful about as Christians today. A justifiable affair is a very difficult one to quit. If I get into an affair that I justify saying, oh, you know what, my marriage wasn't that good anyway, or I'm actually doing it for this reason, or it doesn't mean anything, or, you know, it, it's, it's, it's whatever, it's harmless, blah, blah, blah. Once we justify our sin, once we justify any sin, it's hard to quit it. And you'd be amazed at what we can justify. We practice cognitive dissonance at ridiculous levels, right? I'm I shared with you guys last week, this, you know, kind of my stupid mentality about, about um, uh, smoking meth. Smoking cigarettes, I think, is one of the greatest examples of, of cognitive dissonance, of intentionally doing something. I remember the first time I smoked a cigarette. I was standing at the alleyway behind the high school in Deming, and uh, there was this guy, Harold, there. Harold was a smoker. All the smokers hung out there. I wanted to become a smoker because all my friends were smokers. So I went over there, and I found Harold, and Harold was there. I said, hey, Harold. No, could I bum a cigarette off of you? I wanted to act pro. He's like, I didn't know you smoked. Oh, yeah. Been trying to quit for a while, but you know. So he hands me a cigarette. Now, I don't know about any of you who smoked before, but here's what Howard handed me. Howard handed me a Bristol non-filter. <laughs> You're going to start smoking. That is a good way to die. It's so, gross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? So I grabbed that cigarette. <sighs> I want to look good. I've been practicing how I was going to hold it. Back then, you could get the cigarette candy, so I've been practicing. Practice how I was going to hold it, how I was going to light that cigarette, lit that flame up, took that deep puff in, breathed it in, breathed it out. Man, that was smooth, Harold. That did not happen, did it? What happened? Somebody tell me what happened. None of you were even there. Tell me what happened. You probably choked. Oh, my Back up alone right off the back. I turned green, I puked, oh, yeah. I wheezed. It was the most god-awful thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. It's worse than childbirth. I'm just saying that so my wife will razz me later. Listen, it was so bad, right? And that, I guarantee, is how everybody's first cigarette is, right? Nobody takes that first drug and they're like, it was so smooth, I thought I'd do it again. So what did I do? It was that miserable. I knew it was bad for me, and yet I needed this. I'm going to try again, thinking swiftly, right? So th th this, is, this is who we are as people. And, and it says a lot about us. We, we will practice cognitive dissonance. We will do ridiculous things that we know are wrong, and then we'll justify them. And there's the danger of the enemy. Once we justify it, it's almost impossible to quit. That's why any person who's been an addict of anything, if they're in that stage of justifying why it's okay and it's not dangerous, they're not going to quit. Nothing is going to get them to quit. I have friends who, um, you know, in the, last, in the last five years, I've had two friends die from cirrhosis of the liver, drank themselves to death. And the doctors told them, both of them, if you do not quit, you're going to die. And both of them said, I'm going to keep drinking. I don't care. All the way to their deathbeds. I mean, th this is ridiculous what we'll do. And so this justifiable affair, it's, it's very difficult to quit. But if we continue doing this, he says, look, um, beware, I'm throwing her on a bed. You know, and he's kind of playing with the words here, the, the, the bed that she would go on, the, these, these couches that they would have on the guilt or they would engage in whatever acts. He says, I'm going to throw her on the bed. And those who commit adultery with her, I'm throwing into great distress unless they repent of these things. So he's making a reference to the suffering that's going to be caused by her own affairs. When you engage in an affair, when you engage in sin, you usually pay the price for it, right? Mm -hmm. but, but here's the thing. When, when, I was a, when I was an alcoholic, when I was drinking all the time, wrecking my vehicle, man, I, I would go to jail on such a regular basis for just stupid things, living a stupid life. Um, you know, all, all these bad things were happening around me. My friends were going to jail. They were dying. And I'm thinking, man, the devil's trying to get us. Now I look back and I realize the devil wasn't even there. He, had, he wasn't even bothering messing with us because we're busy destroying ourselves. You see, the intrinsic value of sin is death. It's, it's not that the, 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 the bad things that when you sin happen to you is a punishment from God. That's not how it works. The bad things that happen to you from sinning are the intrinsic value of that sin. That's why Paul says that the wages of sin is death. 
If I'm speeding 180 miles an hour, I'm um, going down, going down highway one, you know, I'm, I might get a ticket because it's illegal, but I'm probably also going to die. And I'm not going to die because it's illegal. And that's the punishment that I receive for speeding. I'm going to die because that's the intrinsic value of doing something stupid like that. And the intrinsic value of sin is death. And so God's telling, look, I'm going to throw her back on her couch. You guys are going to suffer from the things that you're doing. As we read Revelation, we're going to find that a lot of people are reaping what they sow. That this is what your sin does. It leads to this death. He says, I'm he who searches hearts and minds and will repay you according to your deeds. So God is saying, I, I, I know your heart. I know your mind. I'm going to repay you to your deeds. Both of them matter. What's in your heart does matter. And what you do also matters. And we need to be very clear about that. We, we talk about James all the time that faith without works is dead. But I still hear a, an entire, uh, you know, community of Christians who are always saying, eh, it doesn't matter. So long as you've received Jesus, it doesn't matter. If, if your works don't follow your faith. You never had faith in the first place. Right? Right. Okay. And then he says, I'll strike her children dead. Now, this is again a, a reference to Jezebel in, in 2 Kings 10. Okay. Uh, 2 Kings 10, 1 through 11. Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. So Ahab's got 70 sons. That's a lot of kids. Now, Jehu writes letters and sent them to Samaria and the rulers of Jezreel, the elders, the guardians of the sons of Ahab, saying, since your master's sons are with you and you have at your disposal chariots and horses, a fortified seed and weapons, select the son of your master who is best qualified. And anyway, long story short, he drags all these people together. He brings all the sons together and then kills the 70 persons, put their heads in a basket and sends them back to Jezreel. All of her sons are killed. All of Jezreel's progeny, all of Ahab's progeny are dead. They're killed because of her acts. And, and this is what God is saying. Because of this, her sons are going to die. So he's making a, revel, uh, uh, a, a parallel back to, to what we're seeing there. But he's also warning of, of the created legacy of deception that we create. You guys remember reading the passages in the scripture where God says, and I will punish the iniquities of the father to the third and the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. You ever wonder what... what what does that mean? I mean, why would you punish my kids for what I did? Why would you punish their kids for what I did? That that's, doesn't seem fair. But he's saying the same thing there that he's saying this, that he's saying here, that I'll strike her children dead. What he's saying is that when we engage in this lifestyle, when we engage in this belief that, you know, um, I don't have to be accountable to God just so long as I've said a prayer, I can live this way, I can act this way. This becomes the legacy that we pass on to our children. And think about it, I'm willing to bet that every one of us has some kind of a legacy that we can trace in our family. Um, especially on my father's side, alcoholism is the legacy that we leave in our family. That, that it's who we are. It's, it's part of the, that machismo Mexican um, kind, kind of who we are. This, the legacy was of, of, of um, my wife serves me, I'm a drink, and I work hard. And, and if I do that, then nobody's allowed to judge me. And that became a legacy that, that my father and I both had to break in our families. And I want to break because I don't want to leave that as a legacy for my children. It's legacies that we do when we engage in acts, when we see uh, parents who, who engage in lifestyles of drugs, they end up passing that to their children, right? Parents who smoke have kids who smoke. It's, it's, it's a pretty common thing. The, the legacies that we, in, that we engage in today, are, or the acts that we engage in today are the legacies that we will leave for our children. And if we leave a legacy of sin to our children, they're going to be struck dead. They're going to inherit the death that comes from sin. So we today need to be a people to say, we're going to repent. So it's a warning of creating this, this legacy of deception. And he says, to those who hold your teachings. In other words, if you're doing this, you're easily identif identifiable. He says, um, or to those who do not hold your teachings, you're easily identifiable if you're not doing this. You're sticking out. And you haven't learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, which is this inauthentic or ignorant morality. And saying, I'm going to pretend to be a Christian. I'm pretending to follow Christ, but I'm not going to do it when I go out in the world. I'm going to be a, a, a hypocrite when I do it. I'm going to be inauthentic as a Christian. Or even I'm just going to be ignorant. And, and to be fair, there are a lot of people today who are ignorant, who don't realize these things. Who are saying, well, this is what we're supposed to do, aren't we? Aren't we supposed to be a people who believe that God is going to, to save us through this way? Or God wants us to raise up an army to fight the bad guys? Isn't that what God would want? And, and we believe those things because we've been taught that as a legacy. But those things are not scriptural. That's not how God works. You know, the notion of, of you know, the 
the, uh, recently has really come to the forefront has been things like Christian nationalism. You know, I love America. I'm a patriot of this nation. I count it a blessing to have been born in this nation. And, and I love, I love, you know, what we have. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And I believe that our nation should glorify God. But the notion that God chose America as special above other nations, that's blasphemous. But we're taught that in many churches and as Christians. Well, God, God chooses America to be the vehicle and God's using America. We are founded on Christian principles. So what? So what if a nation is founded on Christian principles? That's wonderful for that nation. But that doesn't mean that that's the way God is going to work. God works through the church. He makes that very clear. What you won't find anywhere in the Bible is, here's a letter to the nation that I've chosen to work. Mm. He writes letters to the churches, to the new Israel, to us. He says, hold on to what you have until I come. In other words, continue in your works of love, faith, service, and perseverance without compromise. And to those, he says, I'll give authority over the nations. This is really cool. Um, this is a, a reference to Psalm 2, and I do want to read this to you. So Psalm 2 says, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds asunder and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them with his fury saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. And he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with an iron rod, with a rod of iron, and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and trembling. Kiss his feet, or he will be angry, and you will perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Happy are all who take refuge in him. So think about what you just read there, the, the language that's being used there. Um, and then what's being used here in Thyatira when he says, I'll give authority over the nations, right? To rule them with an iron rod as when clay pots are shattered. He, it's an obvious reference to Psalms 2. It's an obvious reference to the Messiah, to Jesus. He's pointing back to himself. And it's even interesting the words that he uses when he says things like, I will give authority. Um, in some of your Bibles, it might even say, I will give to rule over the nations. I don't know if you guys have a translation that says that. Or to rule, right here, 27 is what I'm looking for. This word is... is Poimane. And it's, it's, it's the same word that means to, to shepherd. In fact, you find it when in John, when he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. It's, it's the same word. That's what he means to rule. So we need to also be mindful that while our translations say something, the, the, um, the, the reference isn't to like rule with this um, in a forceful way, but to tend like a shepherd, to feed, to care for. This is what he's looking for, for us to do. And this is the way that Christ himself rules over us. He says he'll dash them to pieces. And these are um, references to, to Christ Jesus. Uh, we see this later in Revelation 12, 5 and in 1915, when he talks about the iron rod. But he says, even as I also received authority from my father to the one who conquers, I will give the morning star. Now, I want to talk about this for a second, the morning star. What do, what do you think that might mean, the morning star? Does it sound like something that would be kind of mystical or mysterious or something we might look at and say, oh, what could that possibly be, right? Because these are the yeah. things that we, we try to look at. Go ahead, Lewis. Jesus Christ is the morning star. That's yeah. The Bible. yeah, absolutely. Jesus is the morning star. In Revelation, it answers it as well. Um, later in twenty two sixteen, it is I, Jesus, who sent my angel, my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So when he says he's the morning star, and he says I'm going to give you the morning star, this is just another. It's it's another reference to this intimacy that God is going to do when when we get to Revelation twenty one and twenty two. We are going to see that those who are faithful truly do receive the morning star. That is the gift. That's what it's about. Jesus is the goal. He's the prize. And, and, and as we start to recognize that and realize that, it should start to shape the way we act and, and live as Christians. And then, of course, 29, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. 
which is just saying, um, listen, understand, and do. Right? Hear it, understand it, and do it. So the church of Thyatira was, was really about this spirit of, of privatized faith. Don't tell me what I believe, and it's okay if I do that. I'm justifying it. You don't know what it's like. I have to do these things, and I'm not really cheating on God. I'm just, I'm just kind of doing this other thing. And it does become very easy for us, even today, to engage in that, especially if we have the spirit of privatized faith. There is no such thing. Our faith is to be communal. It's to be held in account. This is why even church membership is a biblical concept um, so that we can participate in the way that God calls us to participate in the church. All right, I know we went over a little bit, but do we have any, any final questions, comments, concerns? I think, I think the morning star is uh, he's in us when we accept uh, when he, we accept him as Lord and Savior. So he's He's, he's in us all the time. He's with us. Um, I know the ultimate goal is once we leave this earth, we will be with him. Right now, he's, he's in us. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, upon our, our salvation, we're filled with the Spirit. The Spirit lives within us, and the Spirit works within us. And we do look forward to the day when, when Christ will return. And, and I do and I absolutely believe with Brother Lewis here, you know, when we do pass, we go into the presence of Christ, whatever that looks like, um, until the, the resurrection, at which time it, we will live in our, in our physical bodies for an eternity in his presence. But yeah, the, the spirit is in us as soon as we receive him. The spirit works in us. And that's why Paul says, don't quench the spirit, right? We need to listen and allow the spirit to, to do what the spirit has been doing. The spirit works in us through the provenient grace of God that goes before us. The spirit's been working in all our lives, our entire life. The Spirit works in the lives of everyone. When we receive Christ, the Spirit uh, seals us into that. We're sealed through the, through the mystery of baptism into the church. And the, the Spirit sanctifies us, works with us, so that we have no excuse. Um, um, Dwayne Grider, an amazing AOG uh, evangelist, had, had, uh, had once said something that I just loved so well. He said, you don't have to sin. Nobody does. If you sin, it's because you choose to. And he's right. The Holy Spirit makes it so that we don't have to anymore. We, we choose those things. So we, we can live free from sin because of the work that God does. And even in a world where we, where we wrestle with, where, where is that line, right? I got a question. Sure. Um, prioritized faith. Can you, do you compare that to where um, he tells us not to be lukewarm? Or... I don't know. Am I confusing that? Uh, a little bit. When, when we get there, we'll talk about what that means. But that, that is also, I, I think, a pretty good example of it, that our privatized faith means, look, I have faith in God. Nobody else can tell me anything about it. And I know where I'm at with God. You know, uh, I, you say, you know, me, me and God, have we've had a conversation. We're good. <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way. I've had people tell me, me and God, we, we have, we've worked this out. It doesn't work that way. No, you didn't. You worked that out with something. And maybe your imagination, maybe the devil. It wasn't with God. God doesn't strike deals. You got better luck striking a deal with the IRS than you do with God, right? He does not strike deals. He does it this way and only this way. But it does often lead to lukewarm Christians. And it actually very often leads to lukewarm Christians. Lupe, you're right. Mm. Yeah. Interesting enough, my, uh, my daughter actually um, texted me this week asking you know, a few questions. And, uh, you know, she's not been one to be, you know, a believer yet, but I asked her, you know, cause I'm trying to get, uh, you know, my family in, in to believe. And, uh, she, uh, she said, well, I believe, but I, you know, I don't think I have to go to church and, and I kind of, well, you've explained it enough times or I was able to explain it to her that says, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, but it's, you know, it, it doesn't really work that way. And that's not really what God designed us to be. And so it was kind of interesting that, that that came up today. And then my mom, who unfortunately, when uh, I was younger and we were going to church, uh, she was turned away from the church by uh, seeing, you know, an elderly couple in the church uh, bad mouthing another lady. And then ever since then, she says, well, I'm not going to go to church, but I still believe in God and I don't need the church, you know, and I've been working against that as well, trying to convince her. Yeah, and, and those are difficult. I remember, you know, making very similar statements. You know, I don't have to go to church to do it. Um, 
Uh, it can be the, 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 the CEO Christian, you know, the Christmas and Easter only. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I was sharing with somebody uh, today or yes, yesterday, you know, I, I remember only going on Easter when my mom would say, hey, you should really go to church. They're having a service. I'm like, ah, fine, mom, I'll go to church this Easter, you know, or I'll show you nephews getting baptized. You should show up. Yeah. All right. I'll be there. You know, you know, those, those things, but I didn't want to. It's like, I'm, I'm good with God. And, and you can find confidence or you can find, I think, peace and hope in the fact that someone's wrestling with it, that that's awesome, that we live, we serve a God of grace, absolutely serve a God of grace. And, and I always err on the side of grace. And, and I believe that God does as well. But we, we try to encourage people because we know that, that we need it. I mean, uh, I've had people tell me, you don't have to go to church to get saved. You're right. I, I, I don't. I don't have to go to church to get saved, but I would doubt anybody who really has a relationship with Jesus wouldn't want to go to church, right? Um, I, I think uh, I'm going to use Lupe again. You know, Lupe could tell me all day long she's an Oakland fan, but if I buy her tickets and, and I give her free parking pass to the games and she doesn't go, I'm going to question whether she likes Oakland. Although deep down inside, I think that if I got her some for, for the Niners, she would go because yeah. maybe she wants to be one and, you know, Levi Stadium's calling to her. Right, right. I love to rass her, but th th those things are real. What we do does say things. If I'm married to my wife, tell my wife, hey, we're, we're going to get married, but I'm not going to go live with you. And I don't really want to see you. Am I really married? Yeah. Well, you know, a different angle would be, you know, when I was growing up in Watsonville, I, I never really felt like I belonged there. Right. I mean, I was born and raised there for 30 something years. And I never felt like I belonged there. And I, you know, I come to Los Banos uh, almost 10 years ago. And then it was probably nine years ago we started coming to church. And it started on an Easter, by the way. <laughs> and, and then we kept coming. And, and, and lo and behold, now I actually feel like I belong, you know, to a city, you know, to a community. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was missing that whole time. I felt like I was missing something. Um, and I didn't know that until I got here and until we became part of the church family. Yeah, absolutely. We have to be a part of the community and that, that's what it comes down to. We start at the church and from there, then we can become um, parts of the community that affect the community in a positive and Christ-like way. Your very act of living is supposed to affect the world around you, in your homes, in your community, at your work. But if we're not practicing that at church, you can't, you can't do it somewhere else. It's not going to happen. It's never in the history of the world happened. It's not going to happen now. Nobody is beyond that. So, all right. Let's, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for all the things that you're doing. I'm thankful for this church, for this family, for this fellowship. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to continue to grow in your image to seek you, that you would help us to be a people who would continue to seek community and to serve you the way you have called us to serve you, Lord. Help us to be blessings into this world, into our community here in Los Banos, and into the state of California, into this amazing nation, Father. Help us to bless America just by the way that we live and exist, Father. But help us to do it so faithfully to you, Lord, recognizing that, that we don't need to separate that, that every part of our life belongs to you, Lord. So guide us, help us to practice discernment in those areas that are that, that are intention, Lord. And um, I, I pray that you would continue to show us grace and help us to show grace to each other, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.